Good morning. I'm Jana Van Amberg. I uh, am a general surgeon in Bend, Oregon. I've been uh, practicing there for about 14 years. I'd like to thank the Seattle Science Foundation for um, asking me to come and, and uh, give this information to you all. I don't know how many access surgeons might be in the crowd. Anybody else? Well, you may be working closely with an access surgeon if you choose to do anterior lumbar surgery. And um, so I'd like to uh, give you some information on proceeding safely in the retroperitoneum. So these are some of our objectives today. Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, help you get some mastery of the retroperitoneal uh, anatomy to avoid injury. Uh, hopefully, uh, you will have a better understanding of the potential space in the pre and the retroperitoneal areas. Um, also, I'll talk a little bit about preoperative evaluation of patients uh, and give you some tips and tricks to help you maintain safety while you're operating in the retroperitoneum. So, as you're all aware, there are many different ways uh, and techniques for approaching the anterior lumbar spine. <coughs> The L5 S1 disc space is most amenable to the anterior approach, and um, and so the more superior lumbar disc spaces can be approached laterally. So I will be discussing supine a lift as well as lateral a lift in my talk today. I initially uh, learned to provide L5 S1. Uh, ALIF exposure and also L45 through supine um, entrance. And here are some of the pros and cons of supine ALIF um, operations. Obviously, this is a familiar position for vascular and general surgeons to operate uh, through the abdomen is with the patient laying supine. Uh, we have good retractor systems that have been developed for this. Anesthesia likes it because they have excellent airway control. Um, and it, it um, allows us to use small lower midline or fan and steel incisions. On the other hand, it's a little bit ergonomically challenging because you're having to stand over the patient and, and bend forward. Uh, it uh, can be very difficult to retract abdominal contents in certain patients when you're approaching them supine. And it also frequently requires turning the patient if you want to do multiple procedures at the same time. On the other hand, we have a lateral ALIF uh, procedure. Um, and there's some pros and cons to this as well. Um, for instance, if you're going to perform multiple operations, uh, as in an a lift at L5S1, an X lift at L4-5, and posterior screw fixation, you can do it all in one position. And this is actually safer for the patient because you don't have to turn them while they're under general anesthesia and risk losing your airway control or, or uh, having some other in injury while you're doing that. Um, it decreases overall anesthesia time, or OR cost, uh, and OR time in general. Um, retraction of the abdominal contents is somewhat easier in the uh, lateral a lift position, and this can lead to less ileus down the line. Also, there's better ergonomics for operating because uh, for the access surgeon, they can actually sit down to operate, and you can have the, the uh, wound right in front of, at eye level. So there's a plethora of complications associated with ALIF surgery, um, and many of them are listed here. I'm going to uh, focus on a few of these things, and in particular talk about vascular injury. So when we start out doing this operation, we have to be aware of the lower abdominal wall anatomy, and this uh, delineates the different layers of the abdominal wall. Um, obviously, once you're through the skin and uh, camper's fascia, you get to the anterior fascia, the external oblique, internal oblique, and you're actually operating between the transversalis fascia and the transversus abdominis. And below the arcuate line, there is no posterior fascia. 
So this is the sweet spot for access surgeons where you want to get into that space between the transversalis fascia and the transversus abdominal muscle, and then you start uh, working laterally to get into the retroperitoneal space. Eventually, you get down to the peritoneum. And one of the things that uh, is our nemesis is we really don't want to get into the peritoneum. But if that happens, you can easily repair the peritoneum uh, with a running 3 0 uh, vicral or uh, absorbable suture. Uh, I'm, my mistake there, it's not non absorbable, but you'll want to use an absorbable suture. If by chance, there is actually a bowel injury. You really need to think carefully before proceeding any further with the operation because the last thing you want to do is infect the retroperitoneum or the spine with colon flora. That's really bad. Um, I have never had a bowel injury going in on a case and so have not had to truncate a case um, because of that, but, but that's something that you would really need to seriously consider. Um, but eventually, the peritoneum is easily moved off of the retroperitoneal vessels, and then you can start, as an access surgeon, start working on moving the vessels off of the ALL. You want to be careful about the ureter. Obviously, uh, it runs across those vessels uh, in the space in which you're working, in the retroperitoneal space. Um, Previous operations like radical prostatectomy or uh, radical hysterectomies where pelvic lymph node dissections may have been done uh, can make uh, damage to the ureter uh, more possible. So it's a little bit riskier. So if you're aware of that ahead of time, you may opt to have stents put in the ureter to um, help you identify uh, the ureters. Um, it's not always necessary to see the ureter on these cases, but it is a good idea to have, to know whether it's wanting to move laterally or medially um, in relationship to the spine. So once you get into the retroperitoneum, you have to be aware of the various structures that are back there that potentially could be damaged. And here is just an example of um, retroperitoneal vessels and nerves and lymphatics. We're all familiar with the normal vascular anatomy. Um, the arterial anatomy is depicted here on the right side. The venous anatomy is depicted on the left side. But these are really very cursory uh, anatomical considerations, and I'll go into more detail later. One extra little thing is we need to remember the rectal venous drainage. Um, this is usually covered by the medial sacral vein, but also the superior uh, rectal vein. And this superior rectal vein can sometimes drape across the L5-S1 disc space and requires a little bit of a gentle uh, teasing to push it inferiorly so it's out of the way. Normal nerve anatomy is depicted in uh, this picture. And as um, Dr. Menez uh, talked about, there's multiple concerns about nerve injuries. He went over things really pretty well. But one of the things that I have noticed is I have to be careful about the lateral uh, femoral, cut femoral cutaneous nerve and the uh, genitofemoral nerve branches. Sometimes those can be compressed. They're rarely divided uh, with an anterior approach, but sometimes they can be compressed with retractors and so forth. And I have had patients say that they've had some sensory deficit, which turned out to be completely temporary. Multiple nerve injuries um, are depicted in the literature. Um, retrograde ejaculation is one that's of great concern to males. And I will talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. A denervation bulge appears to a layperson to be like a hernia, but isn't actually a hernia. But it's uh, related to uh, damage to nerves that exit the lumbar spine and come around and innervate the anterior abdominal muscles. And um, I have dealt with two or three of those injuries. And usually, I get a plastic surgeon to help me out repairing those. Um, and then there's other nerve injuries that are listed there. 
We also have to think about the lymphatics in the retroperitoneal space and understand that there are lymphatics that follow the vessels, the great vessels back there. And most of the time, some lymphatics necessarily must be divided in order to mobilize the vessels. And a lymphocele can occur. I had one patient who had a lymphocele develop, and she um, required serial drainage of the lymphocele until she finally developed enough lymph channels that it took care of itself. Uh, it can be uh, dealt with by placement of a, a temporary drain in the lymphocele cavity. But if the lymphocele persists for longer than two or three months, you may have to have a general surgeon do a peritoneal window. Um, but I've never had to do that um, up to this point. And this is a quite rare complication. So one of the things that you need to be aware of is any vascular anomalies that might be present in the retroperitoneum before you go in. And you can look at your uh, preoperative MRI and pick up on a lot of these. Um, Coase in 2011 uh, delineated uh, several vascular anomalies in patients that he had been operating on and found that 17% of them had some kind of vascular anomaly. But um, as a general rule, we, we don't see a lot of these. Um, some of those that are uh, listed here, though, are more common. For instance, an enlarged medial sacral vein, uh, I've seen several of those, and they can be kind of tricky uh, because you don't know if you're looking at the common iliac on the right and the left or if you're looking at an enlarged sacral vein and the common iliac on one side. And so you just have to dissect a little bit more until you can delineate the anatomy before you proceed. This is an example in one of my patients um, of an enlarged medial sacral vein. This particular patient had had a lower uh, extremity burn uh, injury several years before. It was quite severe. He survived that. And for some reason, his medial sacral vein probably enlarged at that time. I've had other patients with um, pelvis or lower extremity injuries that have had enlarged sacral veins. And it, it's just anecdotal on my part, but that seems to be something that I have to consider if I have a patient like that. Um, but you can see here, this vein is quite, quite large. And you can see it extending down over the the disc space here. So another problem uh, that access surgeons will run into is uh, the veins might want to adhere to the anterior longitudinal ligament. This can be denoted uh, on a preoperative MRI when you don't see a, flat, a fat plane between the vessel and the ALL. And I um, did have a a picture of that, an image of that, but for some reason that didn't get loaded. Um, but you can see this in certain um, situations. For instance, uh, an extremely mobile spondylolisthesis, uh, because they've developed some inflammation in that area, you can see it with the formation of osteophytes. Uh, previous fractures, of course, will lead to inflammation. Previous radiation can cause stickiness of the vein on the ALL and any previous retroperitoneal uh, operation. So in other words, any acute or uh, chronic inflammatory process can cause adherence of the veins to the ALL. If you know that that might be the situation before going in, then at least you're prepared for it and you can uh, deal with it. Aneurysms can occur, and it can be very difficult or impossible to operate around these aneurysms. Um, if possible, you need to get a vascular surgeon to treat that aneurysm with um, a stent, uh, if possible, because that, that gives you uh, the ability to mobilize the vessel uh, a whole lot easier and more safely once that stent has been placed. Let's talk about the iliolumbar vein. I have a neurosurgery um, colleague who calls it the vein of death. Um, it's usually not well depicted on anatomical um, illustrations. Um, but you, can, oops, you can see it depicted here. 
very nicely. And then here it's been nicely dissected out. And this is the usual anatomy you will see. You will see a tiny, like uh, one centimeter trunk with three tributaries that come off of it. Um, it can be a tricky vein to um, mobilize and divide. And the only reason you really would need to divide this is if you are gaining access to L45. There are several different configurations to the iliolumbar vein. Um, you can have one, two, three small tributaries that come into the common iliac just after the IVC divides into the common iliacs. I've seen as many as four small veins coming into the common iliac vein. They all have to be dealt with and, and uh, clipped and divided, but there is no problem with doing that. Also, there can be some all kinds of anomalies with the um, iliac vessels, uh, and these are just some examples that I was able to find in the literature. As long as you're aware that those um, are there, um, then you're ready to deal with them as you go in doing your um, anterior approach. Mm -hmm. Ureteral injuries and hernias can occur. Uh, transection or nicking of a ureter. Uh, is really kind of a major problem. If that happens, you want to repair the ureter over a, a stent, and a spatulated repair is the best. If you have a urologist who is available to help you with that, it's really nice, but if not, you need to be sure that you know how to fix a ureter that gets divided. Incisional hernias can occur. Uh, they're pretty rare, uh, but sometimes happen in case the patient gets a wound infection, uh, and usually they require a mesh repair. Also, the inguinal canal can be disrupted um, if you're not careful with these operations, and so those can also be repaired with mesh. Uh, you can run into a patient that maybe had a kidney transplant, and you need to just be aware of that before you, you proceed with your anterior approach surgery, and if so, don't go on the kidney side, go on the other side. Um, so it doesn't preclude uh, getting to L5S1 completely. However, someone who has a pelvic kidney, it does kind of preclude doing that operation because frequently those people, this is their only functioning kidney and you don't want to make it not function, then you'd really be sad. So I just basically say, no, I can't help you with this one, sorry. Fortunately, that's really, really rare. Radiation therapy, I call it the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Um, but you will see this with prostate cancer uh, treatment, any kind of pelvic malignancy treatment where they've done some radiation. Um, it results in super sticky tissue. The normal uh, planes, tissue planes that you see uh, in the retroperitoneum can be pretty much gone. Um, and so on your preoperative imaging, you look for fat planes or fat pads between the vessels and the ALL. Um, to see if you think you can get to the spine for the, for the spine surgeon. Uh, finally, gastrointestinal factors. We talk about uh, people getting ileus from time to time. I don't see it as much with the lateral alif as I saw it with the supine alif, but it can occur. Um, if you have someone who's on a uh, high dose opiates, sometimes it's a good idea to have them start before surgery, a couple days before surgery, taking stool softeners and, uh, and or laxatives, and it will help them postoperatively. Um, radiation therapy, whoops, that's the wrong way. And then uh, another um, complication that I talk to extensively with my male patients is retrograde ejaculation. Uh, the incidence is about 0.9 to 2% in the literature, and, and um, it's a higher incidence uh, with transperitoneal exposure, which I don't generally do, uh, and for some reason, higher with the use of uh, bone morphogenic protein 2. Um, but we haven't really been able to figure out why that is. Um, but all men should be informed of this complication before proceeding with ALIF. Uh, usually it's temporary, but can be permanent. 
Uh, some men want to be treated. If they're young men and they are still concerned about their fertility, they, they will seek treatment. You can refer them to a urologist, but here are some medications that have been helpful uh, for my patients. Um, but like I said, it's fortunately not a very common um, complication. It seems like the less sharp dissection you do, the less often they will have this retrograde ejaculation problem. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about instrumentation in the operating room. For supine lift, I usually will uh, use a standard um, round ring retractor system. Uh, I'll have some vascular clamps and needle drivers available um, and have some 4-0 um, non-absorbable suture available. Uh, I'll use a peanut uh, on a Kelly clamp, a large Kelly clamp. Uh, I'll have some hemostatic agents available. Uh, many access surgeons like to use Tacosil, um, but I use uh, fibular usually or gel foam, and you can uh, use thrombin on those if you wish. Uh, I also use alternate energy uh, for cauterization, things like acu uh, acu I'm sorry, Aquamanus or Ligature. Um, and then I usually will have a cell saver um, functioning before I ever start the case. You don't have to do this uh, because it does increase cost to the patient, but what I found is if you do have a bleed happen, you need that cell saver right now and you don't have time to wait for somebody to come in and set it up for you. Uh, so that's my reasoning on uh, having a cell saver available. Um, for a lateral ALIF, I change up a couple of things. I um, will use endoscopic kitteners instead of um, just a regular uh, peanut sponge on a peon because the endoscopic kitteners, as you'll see in our demo uh, a little later, are uh, better at being able to visualize the anatomy in the retroperitoneum. I will use a lap or, or a, an endoscopic or disposable clip applier instead of a large um, clip applier. And then uh, I'll use baby lap sponges sometimes instead of regular size sponges. I also frequently will have the, the cell saver set up in time and on the back table, I'll have them uh, have some laparoscopic needle drivers in case I need to repair a vessel in the lateral a lift. The incidence of vascular injuries uh, is about six to 7%. Usually it's venous injury with a 1.3 to 6.1% venous injury rate and less than 1% arterial injury. Um, the incidence increases with the number of levels that you're exposing during the case. And many people worry about arterial calcification, but it doesn't seem to increase the risk of arterial injury. Um, however, it does seem to increase the risk of arterial thrombosis just because you've got all that calcium and gunk in the artery, it seems to make it more prone to, to thrombosis. But overall, the risk of, of thrombosis still remains at less than 1%. So if you have a vessel that you have injured uh, getting down to the spine, how do you repair it? Arterial injuries are really, really rare, but of course the, the blood loss can be devastating. So the first thing is to get proximal distal control. Then you'll want to use a uh, running um, non-absorbable suture, 4 or 5 in size. And at, once you've got the bleed under control, you can uh, uh, put a hemostatic agent on it and then consider stenting that artery. If you're a vascular surgeon, you can probably do it yourself. If you're a general surgeon, you'll want to have your vascular colleague look into that. For venous injury, direct pressure, go ahead. You're, you're speaking in generalities, hemostatic agent, can you be more specific on that? Um, that control, do you use vessel loops? Or what do you do? No, a hemostatic agent, when I talk about that, I'm talking about something like gel foam, thrombin, uh, Tacosil, some of those things. Um, for an artery, I would suture it and then put a hemostatic agent on it. For a venous injury, you don't necessarily need to get proximal and distal control. Direct pressure with a hemostatic agent is usually adequate. <laughs> 
And even in a situation where you have a rather good sized um, injury to a vein, you can use the, the product called Tacoseal, which uh, you just lay it on there and hold it for three minutes and it totally seals up the opening. It's pretty amazing. Was that made by? I don't know right off the top of my head, but I can, I can look it up for you. Um, so rarely you need to get uh, proximal and distal control, and the only time I've had to use Rommel tourniquets is on revision cases, uh, where the vein was super stuck to the, the ALL, and it was very difficult to get it off of that ALL, so I ended up getting proximal and distal control, control with Rommel tourniquets and then, and then basically used a cautery to get the vein off of the, the anterior spine. And so if you have a larger or longer injury of the vein and you've had to suture it and it has <coughs> narrowed the vein a bit, you really want to consider having your vascular colleagues stent that vein. So the other important thing to remember is if you have a venous injury, you need to anticipate that your patient is going to develop a DVT after their lumbar surgery. And so this is one time when you want to think about giving them low molecular weight heparin uh, in about 24 or 48 hours after the operation. Um, the overall rate for DVT with A-lifts is actually quite high. It's 13 to 15.9 percent. Um, and the risk factors include an, a patient with advanced age, anybody that you have to give a blood transfusion to, um, anybody with elevated D-dimer, fibrinogen or HDL, hypertension, and um, the number of levels accessed. And this is interesting. So if you access one level, uh, the risk is 13.7%. If you ask, access two levels, the risk is 21.3%. And for three levels, the risk goes up to 25.8% chance of DVTs. And that has actually been borne out in my experience that the more levels I access, the more likely the patient is to develop a DVT. So we will generally order an ultrasound on those patients uh, within 24 or 48 hours to, to check that out. Revision operations, we talked a little bit about that earlier and my initial reaction is, oh no, I don't wanna do that. Um, but there is a three to five times risk of complication uh, with those procedures. Uh, bleeding being the biggest risk um, with revision surgery. Retrograde ejaculation is the second uh, greatest risk and then nerve damage and potentially ileus. And Ileus, the only reason is because it usually takes quite a bit longer to, to do a uh, revision access surgery. Um, there was a study done in 2013 that showed a 20% overall complication rate in 25 consecutive patients that they did revision surgery on. Three had vein lacerations. They did stent all these patients, and they, in spite of that, had two ureteral injuries, and one ureteral injury led to nephrectomy. So the risk is significant with um, revision surgery. This was their list of complications um, that they had in their paper, the, the table that accompanied it. And I thought it was interesting, um, in patients that uh, required blood transfusions or lost greater than 500 cc's of uh, blood, uh, they had a significant DVT risk. So this is an x-ray of a patient that needs a revision. This disc right here, this implant, obviously is way too far lateral and had to be removed and replaced. Um, so I had a lot of trepidation about going in on this, this patient. But postoperatively, we did get that implant moved over and the patient had significant in improvement in his symptoms. So for revision operations, the things to keep in mind is review your imaging, look for fat planes around the vessels, look for anomalies that uh, may have arisen as, as part of the previous operation, excuse me. Um, those, what I'm speaking about particularly there is neovascularization. Neovascularization is those little tiny vessels that, that appear in the um, area of inflammation. Um, you want to have blood typed and cross-matched. You want to have vascular surgery backup. 
realize that the tissues are not going to be normal. I usually opt to do these patients in a supine position. And if you're totally uncomfortable with this, hand the patient over to an experienced access surgeon who is more comfortable with it. So this is just a little review of the objectives that we went over today. But I'd like to leave you with a few keys to safe operating. You can review your preoperative imaging as much as you needed with your access surgeon or your spine surgeon. Be aware of where the important structures are at all times, such as blood vessels, nerves, the ureters. Use blunt dissection as much as possible to traverse the extraperitoneal uh, potential spaces and get into the retroperitoneum and know the normal anatomy so that when you have abnormal anatomy, you will recognize it, and then handle the vessels very carefully, particularly in elderly patients or patients that are on uh, steroids. Um, also, if arteries are calcified, handle them with care. This is all I have for you. Thank you to the Seattle Science Foundation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask.